Okay, check that. Which machine is this? You want to turn that on? Okay. We'll get you guys. We're lucky to sit here. Uh, do you want me to find the organizer for you? You should be able to sort it out. Oh, okay, sure. Um, so this is the machine you want to get on, and that loops was in here. Oh, okay. How's that locked there? At the moment, it's locked. So, um... No, it's definitely not that one because yeah. that's doing something completely different. Yeah. So, uh, um, yeah, I should put a note on that. Yeah, Okay, I could use this laptop. Why we get here early? I'll just ask on the desk I have used. over to laptop. I've, otherwise I've got it on a USB, my presentation on a USB card, but we can't get access to this. Yeah. Yeah.
Okay. So I'll be okay, but I just have to put it back to the other one. Okay, well, we've still got a few minutes anyway.
well, the same that use it for lots of It's 11 o'clock, so I think we make a prompt start. I'd like you to welcome you to this, our first working session. We've got three papers looking at uh, reconnected government. The first paper by the Gang of Four, we've got three of the Gang of Four um, who are participants in our uh, program here from Melbourne University. The second presentation um, 
we have from Helen Thompson at the University of Ballarat who has been um, taking part in an innovative program to get rural youth talking and connected. And the third paper, uh, Damien Lewis from Queensland University will be presenting again on youth radio in Queensland. Now, the way that the session uh, will, is organised, papers will be presented for 10 minutes, and I've said to the speakers I'll be ruthless, so that we will have half an hour question time left at the end. Okay, so it's over to the gang of four. That's um, Kate, Melanie and Yuzana. Hello. We just wanted to start with a brief explanation of how three undergraduates managed to find themselves presenting at a conference amongst what could only be described as intimidating company. This time last year, the three of us had absolutely no idea what electronic governance or electronic democracy were. We had no idea who Stephen Coleman was, had never heard of Bowling Together, had no idea who the Minister for ICT was because we didn't really know what ICT stood for. Bless you. However, by the end of the year, we knew all of this and more thanks to an innovative course designed by Dr. Peter Chen called Special Projects Task Force. Special Projects Task Force is a core subject of the Bachelor of Public Policy and Management degree in which the three of us are presently enrolled. The subject is designed to simulate a real policy making environment. Students form teams for the duration of the semester and are issued with a brief outlining requirements for investigation into a particular political issue. The outcomes of this investigation are translated into a report of 20,000 words, providing detailed analysis of research information and making specific policy recommendations. Our project <coughs> investigated the potential for e-democracy in Victoria. We explored the level of democratic participation in Victoria and considered the possibilities ICT could offer towards democratic participation in the state. Civic participation has been impaired over the years because of a lack of equal access for all citizens to IT and diminished trust in government. E-democracy addresses the problem of access and information, thus holds great potential for democracy in the state. We divided our research into key areas, which were education, cost, online content, the digital divide and local government. Under each section of our report, we discussed the key issues and reviewed potential solutions for addressing these issues. Policy recommendations were subsequently pr proposed throughout each chapter. A collation of all e-democracy policy recommendations formulated in the report were then presented in the form of a matrix. Our matrix is essentially a summary of the key problems identified surrounding the implementation of e-democracy initiatives and the solutions to overcome these issues that we recommended after research was conducted. Now we've got an overhead of the policy matrix which we formulated and it would take some time to go through so we're just going to go over um, one of the key policy problems and example of recommendations for each chapter. But if you're interested in having a look at um, the, our policy matrix, we've got a few copies of it just over there and it'll be up in the overhead. So for our, um, the chapter on the digital divide, an example of a policy problem was distance from centres of debate for rural and regional citizens and a policy recommendation um, for this was to subsidise cost of buying computer or installing internet, government sponsored computer stations run by volunteers and promoting e-commerce initiatives to rural businesses to integrate ICT lifestyle. So the chapter on education, a policy problem identified was lack of understanding of the importance of government and lack of particip participation and engagement from youth. Um, some policy recommendations were to develop civic education courses that engage students and teach them about the principles and underlying purposes of democratic politics. Civics education and information sessions at community centres. 
youth forums online that include, include teen topics to get young people involved and motivated and not to see political involvement and interest as boring. For local government, uh, a policy problem recognised was token, a token presence online um, and discrepancies between content of websites. So a recommendation we proposed was to benchmark local government website standards by 2005. For con content, an example of a policy problem was ignorance of political processes and a recommendation put forward was civics education online, self-tutorials on how government works under e an e-government, the e-government homepage. And for costing, the policy problem identified was keeping pace in an environment of high turnover of ICT innovation while restricted to budget allocations. So some recommendations were the re-evaluation of ICT infrastructure in 2005, um, identify which groups in the private sector should take over certain ICT upgrade responsibilities by 2005 and retain public sector ICT infrastructure upgrades in schools, libraries and town halls. Our report was titled A Will and a Way. This rep represents the twin focus of e-democracy policies, one strand addressing the issue of creating universal ICT access and skills and the second addressing the need to increase people's political involvement to more than voting once every four years. Political apathy is a significant barrier towards democratic participation. This term refers to the feeling by many citizens that policymakers and politicians are not interested in the concerns and opinions of the average citizen. In turn, many feel disinclined to voice their opinions. This is a, there is a declining emphasis in civic engagement among youth worldwide. Party enrollment is falling and more people are voting on American Idol than at the US presidential elections. In many schools, civics classes are not promoted in the curriculum and as a result, many youth are failing to understand the importance of their roles as citizens in a functioning democracy. This sense of distrust is made worse by vague, a vague understanding of what the government does and how citizens can engage in shaping policy. This is both fostered and exacerbated by conflict-oriented coverage in the commercial media. Work of the government is portrayed as being out of touch, which defeats the cultivation of citizenship. While some of this might be true, it also remains true that government works equally to empower, support, enable, and protect. Fundamentally, government works to solve the complex and unsolvable problems. This complexity is not conveyed to citizens in two-minute news clips. The brevity of the news cycle fails to adequately inform citizens, only giving a one-sided story. This, in turn, breeds political apathy. If the truth of government is complex and contradictory, then citizenship inevitably mirrors these features. Citizenship nowadays is more than being a male landowner. The truth of citizenship is that it's extremely hard. Um, we're running out of time, so I'm just going to jump ahead a little bit. Um, Sorry. Electronic governance has the potential to make citizenship flow into our everyday lives a little more easily. It means that those who do have the inclination to contribute to policy development don't have to look too far to do it. Electronic governance reduces the intrusion of citizenship. It simplifies it, minimises it and allows it to fit neatly into our pockets, providing we let it. The potential of e-governance looks somewhat dim for those who lack the inclination in the first place. This lack of inclination can have many roots and might be harboured by those of whom we least expect it. For example, we three are the poster girls for idle participation in electronic democracy initiatives. We're tertiary educated, skilled in the use of relevant technology, economically advantaged, socially engaged, politically aware. We're not disillusioned with politics. We know that our contributions matter. We three are the very people who might log on to an electronic civic commons at the end of the day or participate in an online consultation on our lunch breaks. The question is, do we? And the answer is no. Part of this might have to do with the limited opportunities presently available to do this, but essentially we feel that this lack of participation has another origin altogether. The last time I received the electronic newsletter from Multimedia Victoria in my inbox, though I knew that this conference was looming and perhaps it might be a good idea to reacquaint myself with e-democracy, and though I knew that it was my civic responsibility to be politically informed, 
I also knew that my best friend's sister's ba sister had just had a baby and that there were JPEGs of the baby somewhere else in my inbox and that Multimedia Victoria could certainly wait. And after I, looked at my, after I looked at these photos and came across an email from my system administrator telling me that my mailbox was too full and given that I couldn't delete the photos of my best friend's sister's baby in case I wanted to look at them again, the email from Multimedia Victoria had to go. I did all this knowing what I know about the promise of e-democracy and the obligation of the citizen to be well informed and active. And while it's safe to say that I am indeed a bad citizen, I'm also a pretty normal citizen. Um, there are those of us who are willfully disengaged, that is disengaged not by virtue of our scepticism about politics or because we feel that our contribution does not matter, but perhaps because we have three essays due in the space of five days and contributing to the work of government is far less urgent. For us, e-democracy offers little because it's not high on our list of priorities. We know that politics will be Policies will be made and the government will keep on governing whether we contribute to the manner of their government or not. Therefore, what can be done about citizens like us? There are a multiplicity of reasons why individuals are willfully disengaged, perhaps as many reasons as our willfully disengaged citizens. Correspondingly, an equal multiplicity of methods of addressing the causes of willful disengagement is needed. We are plural in the sense that we all position political activity as low on our own list of priorities. However, we differ in our reasons for doing this and therefore can't have our minds changed by a single initiative. What works for one does not work for all. So to wrap, it, to wrap up, as mentioned earlier, our involvement with e-democracy has been less than a year. Fundamentally, however, we believe in the promise of e-democracy and e-democracy initiatives. Expanding and strengthening democracy is a valuable endeavour. In speaking here today, we place our authenticity on the fact that we are three normal citizens. We are disengaged and know many disengaged young people just like us. We hear the promise of e-democracy initiatives but remain somewhat dubious about the reality for three citizens like us. So much for private spaces. Let's move on to public spaces and let's hear from Helen about rural youth yarning. regional rural groups of predominantly who work with regional communities but um, we work with farming groups, we work with researchers, we work with firms in the ICT sector and we work with government. We work with local government through geographical portals um, and online communities. We work with um, across government sectors um, on economic development initiatives to increase export. So we sort of have a really wide range of um, groups that we work with, but the one thing that they have in common, I suppose, is that they're all attempting to use online services to enhance what it is they're, 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 that they're doing. So um, in this particular case, because it's an e-government conference, I selected a client initiative that uh, comes out of the Department of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries. And I suppose you might ask why an organisation like a university in a regional context is involved in this sort of activity. And in this presentation I'll just very quickly give you an idea as to what we see the external context for ICT in a regional context particularly, but also the internal context at the University of Ballarat and why it's important that there is a centre like ours um, undertaking activities in partnerships with all all sorts of regional groups um, to advance their uptake of ICT. I'll then look at a particular initiative and I feel challenged now. <laughs> um, I'll look at the areas of challenge and success for that and it's been really interesting because um, it was a, an initiative that had some very clear goals at the outset. So I suppose firstly the external context that we operate in is that 
Uh, the concept of ICT being good for regional communities has been out there for a long time. That it is going to address a lot of the withdrawal of services. It's going to address a lot of the barriers in terms of distance. It's going to bring information to us. Um, so there's obviously been a significant interest in using online technologies and other information communications technologies for the betterment of regional and rural communities. Um, at the same time, some people are, uh, are quite um, vocal in their calls for caution. Um, and, and I suppose that's, that's the external context that our centre operates in. The university itself um, sees itself very much a, a part of the community and wants to be highly regarded by the communities in our location. Our particular centre was established in 1998 um, and has strong linkages with the School of Business and also Creek is the Centre for Regional Innovation and Competitiveness. So we're not an ICT based school, um, we have more interest in, um, in business and people than we do in technology, although we obviously have significant skills in those areas. My own personal background uh, is definitely from um, the business and community development aspect and I think that brings uh, a, lot, a, a difference to the type of work that we, we do. So our focus is on practical solutions for regional communities <coughs> and the two barriers that we try to address are cost and complexity. Um, research since 1999 continues to see that they're the barriers to people participating in our particular context. Um, we want to provide access to tools that reduce the risk of communities doing it on their own. Um, we want to provide technical services and support because we've seen far too many projects started and finished before the funding finishes and there's no, they haven't reached the point of sustainability in terms of either um, people effort or infrastructure. Um, and we also try and continue our research and development particularly so that we're pushing the boundaries, so that the technologies that we're working with with communities uh, are using the, the latest um, and, and most current technologies. In the area where we operate, we may have quite a lot of web development companies, but we have very few specialist ICT firms. And it's not as though we get firms knocking on our doors offering for us to trial um, particular technologies in our context. So, in a way, there hasn't been organisations coming to regional communities saying here is a service that you might find uh, valuable and useful. So in this particular case we're looking at electronics, electronic governance, governance issues, uh, initiatives that take the form of an online community and also whether a university and a centre like ours can provide facilitation and leadership in that sort of arena. I think I'll skip over the background of of where online communities come from and just look um, briefly at this and in particular in this presentation it's this civic networks um, and government um, led initiatives, this column here. Um, this particular framework has been presented by Denison et al and I, the details would be in the paper. Um, but I suppose what it tries to summarise is the sorts of reasons why people get involved in online technologies. And for civic networks, the areas of high interest go across all of these areas of enhancing democracy, increasing social capital, empowering individuals, revitalising a sense of community, and also providing economic development opportunities. And for a range of initiatives that we've worked with, we find that this isn't a bad way of organising because we have individual organisations, clusters of like organisations in our client group, collectives of sectoral stakeholders. Uh, we see ourselves in some ways as a service and application provider that has a, um, a high focus on ICT engagement. So, you know, it's just a way that we find we can organise uh, some of the activities that we do. But in this particular case study that we look at, it's it's whether or not the initiative is achieving for the government-led agency these type of outcomes for the people who use the system that I'm interested in looking at today. So the Young Australian Rural Network is an initiative that was um, established by the Department of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries to support its young people in rural industries program which is a range of government funded initiatives that might involve 
um, sponsorship for conferences, international conferences, uh, undertaking study, going and doing leadership or mentoring training in Canberra with other young people. Based on research that they undertook in 2001, they identified that more than a third of the people that they were uh, that are involved in rural industries are, are young people aged between 18 and 35. And if they could um, make use of the internet, which was identified as a powerful communication ch channel for that particular um, group of constituents, then it would provide opportunities for the graduates of young people, but perhaps broader opportunities for rural people, uh, rural young people in, in industry. So they were very clear with their objectives in, in terms of what they wanted to achieve and keep in touch, collaborate, share ideas um, and, and find information. It's sort of the general things. And the tool set which underpins the Young Australian Rural Network has been developed to try and respond to those sorts of things. So if the graduates were going to be able to be supported in keeping in touch, they need to be able to find the details of the people who are in their course. They need to be able to find the details of the people who did the same course in another, at another time. They need to be able to contact the people who, who completed the course in the future, perhaps, because even though they weren't there at the same time, they might work in the same industry sector. Um, the networking and communication was about providing forums, providing... Um, publicity for the organisations that young people were involved in themselves so that they could have a space where they could create information and disseminate information about their particular uh, organisations of interest. And then things like the gateway, finding information about uh, whether it's about events or news or gov government grants or other sorts of opportunities for young people. So I suppose in terms of implementation, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm aware that it's the time's very short. But there was a dedicated person employed who was a young person herself to guide the, the implementation of this project. And, and that's been a critical um, <coughs> uh, factor in that it was well resourced in terms of people inside government. But the other thing that was very important in this initiative was that um, right from the outset young people were involved in, in the development of the project. So it started with a survey of young people who had graduated from various courses and the um, invitation to them was to, to tell AFA, the Department of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries, what it is that they thought would be valuable. And that sort of communication has continued um, from the commencement of the, of the project. And what they now do is they much more closely link this resource in with the face-to-face -face activities that... Um, the department carries out. So when the young people go to Canberra for a course or for um, other events, um, they very closely integrate this resource with it so that when they arrive they receive a postcard that tells them what their login details are to the member area of this site. They've got their access details and actually work on initiatives using um, the Young Australian Rural Network while they're in Canberra. So they get them using the resource while they're there. In terms of utilisation, the site um, trends are increasing and, and exponentially. Um, there's more than 500 uh, hits a day, I think, at the moment. Um, but, but the interesting thing is not just the Visits, sorry, visits as in visit today, unique visits. The interesting thing is that um, in the last year there's been more, more than a 400% utilisation increase and I think um, for AFA it's, it's been a realisation that perhaps the service is now beginning to be used um, by young people to actually collaborate so that uh, while they... In the, and I'm sorry because I feel really pushed for time but while they in the first place they wanted to achieve uh, all of those aims in terms of enhancing democracy across all young people in, in rural industry what they've now realised is that perhaps it's time to focus more specifically on, on the individuals where they have face to face contact with because that's where the real doing is happening so that when those people who've actually met have um, 
conversations in a discussion room where it's just people who've had a face-to-face uh, interaction and have now gone home to their various parts of Australia, they collaborate in a very different way than those in an open public forum. So there's more information in the paper, but um, that probably gives you a, a sense of where this one's coming from anyway. So thank you very much. Thanks, Helen. A very vibrant uh, public space here in rural Victoria with young people. Now let's move to rural Queensland. Danny and Lewis. Um, yep, I'm presenting, my name's Damien Lewis, I'm presenting on behalf of the uh, Creative Industries Research and Application Centre at uh, Queensland University of Technology. Um, I am also uh, the Senior Program Officer for Internet Strategies at the Office of Youth Affairs. Um, and those two institutions are involved in a, in a research project together called the Youth Internet Radio Network. Um, so what I want to do is tell you all about that um, and specifically the e-democracy related aspects of it um, that are to become uh, the subject of my PhD uh, research project. Um, so uh, YEARN is the acronym. Um, essentially it's a, it's a media streaming platform for young people across Queensland. Um, it received an ARC linkage in 2003. Um, chief investigators are John Hartley, who's here in the audience over here. He'll chip in later when we um, start discussing. Um, Greg Hearn and my uh, supervisor, Dr. Joe Tacky. Um, this is the website. That'll be at the end uh, for you to look at as well. Um, so as a linkage, uh, QUT arranged a um, number of industry partners, all the all the players that would make it happen across the, the breadth of uh, Queensland. Um, Office of Youth Affairs is, is um, my employer and uh, Arts Queensland. Brisbane City Council is significant because that's where a majority of the youth population in Queensland uh, resides. Um, Q Music is a state NGO um, that specialises in music training and uh, we've also got a number of local councils on board across Queensland. Um, basically, the, the research purpose of YEARN is to provide a platform um, from which many research perspectives can be investigated, um, particularly how ICTs are used for interaction, creativity and innovation. Um, my particular focus uh, on that is, in, is on the uh, e-democracy um, related aspects and particularly youth engagement. Um, I'll hopefully get to talk uh, a bit more detail about that. Um, but, but yeah, as a, as a platform it has a kind of plethora of research aims and a number of researchers working on different aspects of it. Um, this stuff I won't go into in detail, um, but you can see all that and more on the YEARN website. Um, with the practical outcomes. Uh, one thing I will talk a bit about is the methodology. It's, um, it's one that's been devised by uh, CIRAC's researchers, uh, uh, Donald Slater, Greg Hearn and Joe Tacky, and it's called the Ethnographic uh, Action Research Methodology. Uh, they've published a, a, a handbook with UNESCO that details what it's all about. Essentially, it uses um, ethnography to, uh, to guide the research process and action research to uh, make the change necessary to, uh, to develop the actual application. Um, its, its principles are immersion, which um, basically sees researchers on the site in, in uh, local uh, areas. Um, and, and their, their job there initially is to initiate some training and to do that they're using the digital storytelling method which um, whose, whose main champion is Daniel Meadows 
um, from BBC Online, is that right, John? Yeah. Uh, he came and did some training workshops for us in Queensland recently. Um, basically, that uh, trains young people to create digital stories, uh, kind of multimedia um, movies. Um, uh, there there are five day intensive workshops, and that will kick start the, the uh, media creation process for the streaming media uh, website. Uh, okay, so as I said, uh, my main interest is youth engagement. Um, the Office of Youth Affairs defines, in Queensland, um, defines young people as being 12 or 15 to 25, um, the lower being flexible depending on the application. Uh, uh, and the, the premise that OYA works from is based on um, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, which states that young people have the ability and, and therefore the right to be involved in the decisions that are made about them as citizens. Uh, to that effect, it's been implemented in Queensland as the Queensland Youth Charter, which was endorsed by Cabinet in April 2002. And that's basically a, a mandate for Queensland government departments to engage young people in the uh, programs and services that are delivered to them in the development of those. Um, Queensland government also has a commitment to community engagement. Um, Mark Hogan is probably talking in this se uh, session at the moment, so we've missed it. But he is the um, he's uh, the general manager, I think, of um, the community engagement division. Community engagement has basically received a lot of in uh, attention in the current Labor government in Queensland. Um, and as such, there's an e-democracy unit as well within that division that uh, specialises in broader community engagement online. Um, in terms of what OYA does for youth engagement, there's a range of things and the e-democracy stuff is only one aspect that's being uh, investigated. The others are State Youth Advisory Council and Youth Engagement Grants, um, an initiative to get young people on government boards and committees, uh, Cape York Youth Development Strategy, and I think my colleague Kerry Oakes is going to probably go into a bit more detail about that in her session, which I think is tomorrow. Oh, okay, right, this afternoon. Um, yeah, generate. Uh, see Kerry's talk to find out more about that. That's basically the e-democracy online engagement strategy that we've been running together as a team for about three years now. Um, and it's, it's been pretty pioneering in its use of technology. We've been running a thing called Ministers Online for a couple of years, which is a regular online chat room meeting where we actually get ministers into a chat room to talk to groups of young people that are invited to come. Uh, we also do a bunch of web discussion forums and uh, policy deliberation type stuff. Uh, skip over that one. Essentially, we're at the, at the point now where we're looking at um, the third incarnation of Generate and how we can take what we've learnt and what's happening in the world of e-democracy and uh, implement that as another pioneering effort at online youth engagement. Um, so we, we've found that young people are cynical towards politicians. They're not interested in being engaged with government. Uh, I mean, I think Stephen Coleman made those points pretty clear, especially with the younger cohorts. Um, but uh, research that, and literature that we've read shows that young people are, however, strongly concerned with social issues. They just don't seem to think that the government is a, a way that they can make anything happen about them. Um, further evidence, uh, the UK voter turnout, as Stephen Coleman pointed out, um, something like 60% of people aged 18 to 25 didn't vote in the 2001 UK election. The UNICEF State of the World's Children report indicates that um, it thinks the lack of appreciation on behalf of young people for government is one of the greatest challenges facing democracy. Uh, and we have learnt that approaches to engaging young people um, are made difficult 
by the top-down approach of government where it basically sets the agenda for what it wants to engage with the community about. So we are saying that the lack of social ownership of engagement issues is a significant factor um, barrier to the take-up of youth engagement in Queensland. Um, another thing that I've been very interested in lately is the reported tendency of young people towards resistance and rebellion and non-conformity and my favourite book about that is Chips and Pop uh, by uh, um, what are they called? Um, oh, the names escapes me um, but that basically points out that no matter what generation whether from the 1920s or the 60s or the 80s young people have a tendency towards being resistant to authority and institutions. Um, so we're basically thinking that this is perhaps a characteristic that, not, that is not going to go away. Um, today young people are of course also referred to as the information age generations and there's a whole bunch of uh, literature out there about how young people have been affected by media in terms of their development through their formative years um, and very real statistics about how, how uh, heavily they use the internet um, in, in terms of Queensland usage. Uh, so basically these are the questions we're faced with. How can we um, embrace, how can we engage an audience that might be naturally predisposed to resisting engagement? Um, how can we make online collaboration happen between young people and government in terms of developing the, the policies and the programs and services that are delivered to them? Uh, and we have come up with what is being called the Online Youth Engagement Strategy Pilot Project, where we propose to develop and provide online communities to a number of young people uh, based on the interests that they nominate themselves. Um, we kind of imagine it like a grant round um, where basically a group of young people would apply to us. We would give them all the hard stuff that goes into making an online community website and let them run it and go for it themselves with their own identity and their own design and a bit of advice from us about how to build an online community. Um, the important principle is that they own the website, it's not a government website. Uh, we're looking at doing between 10 and 20 of these over the next two years of um, uh, different interest types. Uh, you know, you can imagine a group of young people might nominate a, uh, a, a car modification interest group or uh, you know, anything you can think of off the top of your head uh, really that young people might be interested in. And then we want to investigate how, how these interests that are nominated by young people can be turned into information that government can engage with. So it's very much a mediating role that we're looking at ourselves as um, where we, we are going to try to create uh, a link between interest groups of young people and government departments which are essentially interest groups of policy and look at how we can link the, those two interests with each other and, and create communication between them. Um, I'll just leave it at that. That's the website again if you'd, uh, if you'd like to jot that down and check it out later. And thanks very much. Thanks, Damien. Well, uh, I want to thank each of our speakers for being so disciplined um, in giving such a short presentation. One of the reasons we wanted to create a public space here so that you can make comments or ask questions um, to our speakers. It's, it's a small forum. If, if you'd like to come to the front, um, Please, please do so. Um, <clears throat> so, something that, that uh, maybe I'd like just to hear a reaction about um, is the idea that Ford Motor Company in the States had a while back of uh, providing employees of 
the company with web-based and, and sufficient hardware for them to go out and participate in interest groups, the interest groups, um, with the hope that you know they might create some informal connections with uh, their customer base. Um, and maybe if I could just hear a little discussion on um, whether that would be appropriate from a government standpoint for, let's say, Queensland to um, you know, make that sort of unclear connection of how you, you, know, how you make that, that connection between these communities of interest that are running their own sites from a youth basis and, and how the government can actually receives information or more like um, fosters discussion. Uh -huh. um, yeah, uh, part of the, the proposed project um, that I didn't get to mention is uh, we're planning to develop some communication tools. We're already using a chat room um, and we've identified some weaknesses with that as a media for communication and discussion between government and young people. Uh, what we're looking at is developing a kind of um, a real-time chat client that's uh, more geared towards policy deliberation, a, a more debate-oriented kind of forum. Um, the, the challenge is, of course, that a government is, its policy development process is extremely conceptually dense, and the young people and the public um, in general just aren't really interested or don't have the time to get engaged in that kind of heavy duty discussion and all the work involved to become informed about the business of government. Um, that said, I guess I don't really have an answer to how that might happen, but the point of the research project is to investigate with some action research approaches how that might be developed or how it might be possible. Can I come here with this? Sure. One of the things about the early that Daniel mentioned is that we're actually providing some techniques for content creation as well as providing a connectivity in the network. So that we're not relying on people in some tutors literacy of various technical tools but using workshops to develop a particular skill to a particular skill in that. And that points out a difference that I think came through in the which came in story between uh, the uh, kind of policy formation that's very dense and interesting and what's the kind of clear response of the other industry council versus what people actually want to do together which is to get them to understand who they are mm -hmm. and what life means to them. So it, it's the self expression part of the communication with the government that's really quite interesting in the And uh, self expression needs Tools and the ability to create content uh, using the uh, it, 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 it's really something that you can put on a website and get the positions to come and look at it, like they come to us rather than you've got to look the website and just uh, play it or, or, uh, or uh, what positions can So we're quite interested in creating content as part of the interaction process. We also open to the possibility of the folks who get on with the line and start doing what's not interesting to the government, so it's not interesting to the public that's carried on doing that. So there's quite a lot you know, to find out about how young folks actually do communicate uh, what they want to do, what means that they create a content of interest and chat devices that are preferred by them and so on and so forth. So really, we're exploring. Much how their choices fall as whether there is a successful communication to the government. As I read it, if I can make a comment from the chair, you're actually building communities as you go along. How are these geographical communities? Do you go out to Lismore, for example, or are these communities of interest? Um, which is true, south of the border, isn't it? Um, um, St George, for example. <laughs> Um. Yeah, um, Yearn in particular is more geographically based. Uh, the online communities project that OYA has, has a particular interest in Yearn on is more, uh, more open to whatever kinds of uh, 
community people want to identify with. So if they, if it just so happens a group of young people identifies with a Rockhampton community, then that's okay. But if they identify with a statewide community interested in football, then that's okay too. And there's a whole bunch of um, you know variations in between. You could have a, a regional um, motorcycle interest club, and, and that's kind of thing. Absolutely. Now we've got the, the antithesis here. We've got the thesis. What I want to ask for this gang of three, um, would you relate to a project like you? Now that is regionally based. You're metropolitan here. But I'd like to get your response. If there was something like this that operated here in metropolitan Melbourne, would, would you engage with that? So, yeah, it would come down to what was happening that week. 
I think I'll try about doing that. It's, it's, it's sort of one feels inspired to the people that everyone feels like they can make a contribution. So if I know about the situation that we show in discussion, then I'm, I'm much more likely to be involved, you know, to contribute to that than I am something that I might not know so much about. Just because, you know, you don't feel like you need it. I don't know what you're talking about. And, um, you know, again, the time it's sort of required to make. I mean, it doesn't sort of negate the contribution of people who might not know the ins and outs of the issue, you know, that sort of the comment that might seem sort of obvious for everyone else who is stated is then stated by the person who's not, you know, saturated with information about that issue. Um, <coughs> and that can be very valuable, but just in terms of that creating that impetus to contribute, I feel like feeling like one has value in you know, what about you, Andy? Um, I, I, can you tell me the number of young people who go to sort of online new discussion sites? And I think it's very small as well. And I think it's sort of also away from the internet. I'm struck by the old social movement uh, slogan, the personal is the political. If something's bothering you, then you're engaged. Um. Maybe you could see a place for hex fees, something of a private ill and a public issue. Something to think about. I think um, one of the key things that might draw people in is the chance to participate in content creation in a form that is understandable and manageable and through which they feel they might learn a lot and succeed at. And I say that because I just did the digital storytelling workshop. And um, it's a really incredible experience of self-expression and done in a way that's not intimidating whatsoever. Acme and Norman also does it, so can people who want to um, their use of it. So although the, the kind of the, the attraction of the social movement issues, which does attract young people in the kind of activist realm, um, there's also that far more personal desire be creative and to express yourself. So you have those. Um, and and the, the digital storytelling isn't necessarily about social issues at all. It's about your own life and your own world and your own understanding of things, which other people then might read interesting kind of community issues into. So there's, I think there's kind of just twin aims going on there that young people um, may find an interest. I think the last point that I have about using that thing is incredibly important. I think the real one about, you know, for the front, I think you also have to take all the points in the market as well. It's not too much of a problem, but it's more about confusing the front as well. So I actually think it's a story that's part of that. It's not making assumptions about how you don't think it's a good idea. I mean, I guess for itself, it's taking the young people who are interested in the situation. I've got a question over here. Yeah, I've just got a query and and talk to Dan. I'm looking at this and I've been involved with community project over over quite a few years. <coughs> I've got a concern that you're destroying the very basis of the benefit that we're trying to get the use of. You pointed out that it should be from the bottom up, not from the top down. And yet you, in your very project, have an agenda to create links between the government and the community. And I think the professor this morning in the opening address pointed out that it's up to the government to go to the people, not for the government to create links that it can easily link with. The people are there and it's their tool and I think we have to be very aware that people need assistance to use the technology sometimes 
but once they use it, they all just disappear off in their own direction. But so long as they have the skill to use it, I think we just have to create the where they can communicate with us, where we can communicate with them. And it's never easy to be able to communicate. Um, yeah, I do agree with that. I, I also think that um, a significant barrier to youth engagement is just simply civic education and understanding of what government is and what it does and what business um, it actually takes care of, how it's relevant to people's lives. Um, and that's, that's, I guess, where why this has to take that approach because we, we need people in a forum where they can be accepting that uh, of, of information about what government is doing for them. Um, I mean, otherwise we just be defeated and we go, well, let's just get rid of government and think of something else going to think. Can I? So, Kathy, <laughs> I, think, I, mean, I think the state intervention is, is, uh, is well made. Uh, we're aware of that. There's two things going on. One is that there's a government involvement that government seeks to justify by the rights of we're in university, so we have a share of the world as well, as well. And, um, and so we just have to be aware of that, and it's not pure by any means. And I don't think that what we're trying to do is to kind of push a line which is successful follow from people adopting a certain kind of practice or having a certain kind of knowledge or something like that. We're actually trying to work out what are the dynamics and the stumbling blocks as a recent politician, I've, I've actually come to find that if you post your email address in the web, people with the technology do find you. And you do get it. <laughs> Um, yeah, they do. So it, it does work. Thanks. like to ask a question here which seems to flow on and that is about the chat room because that is one site where you can actually get 
direct representation. And I'm interested in asking Damien about your experience with that. I know you said that there were a few problems, so tell us about it. Yeah, sure. Um, tap rooms are inherently really fun. Um, young people that use the internet um, love them. Uh, it, but the problem with it is that it's kind of anarchic and it's kind of, there's this very um, more of the jungle thing happening in a chat room where the person who's allowed to talk to the bus is like all the biggest words can dominate the discussion. And it's difficult when you've got a situation where you have a minister who is there to hear and listen and engage and converse with a group of people and those, that group of people is um, just kind of getting off on the medium of the thing and uh, it's not very geared around having a productive discussion basically. Um, it's been extremely interesting in a number of other ways. Um, probably uh, the most significant of those is actually getting ministers on a chat room with their policy advisors sitting beside them um, talking to a group of young people who are dispersed without Queensland who've never met each other before and are sitting there as, a, as an anonymous equal with a bunch of young people who can say whatever they like, however they like it, um, to whoever they like and half the time they're not even interested in talking to the minister, they're just interested in talking to the other people that have gone online and, and what it's about. Carrie might have a few comments about that too. She actually moderates for <laughs> Brave woman. The chat room, yeah, like if you look at numbers, like one of the things, and this is always like a super compliment to Emma, like, is it successful? How many young people were there? Okay, well, there were seven on that day. Oh, that's not very many, is it? Well, you know, when you think about it, ten is a, is a, is a hard to manage number on a chat room that's going to be productive. So in fact having seven and what we know about young people is just because you're seven typing doesn't necessarily mean there were only seven involved somewhere in the process. So you can't just take numbers. I mean what do I say about the success of the chat where we had the commission of the children and young people and two young people. And I actually see that as a, that was a highly successful chat because one of those young people is situated in Bamaga, which is way up North Queensland had never been out of that who was able, who was 15, who was able to tell the commission of the children who was quite a respected person that um, more about what it was like to be a young person caring for disabled parents and what that meant for him than she would ever have heard from a forum in Brisbane. Like that young person had this opportunity. So it's sort of like that dilemma we've been having is on the way of numbers might not quite cut it, and the weight of quality is actually quite powerful, and the fact that we do archive and we actually have them up there. But it's also very confronting to the minister and the policy advice. You know, tell your minister that he's going out the door to a doorstop interview, and the, and, and, and the bureaucrats are probably running around preparing re responses to questions before he walks out the door. Exactly the same thing happens in the chat room. It's, this is your doorstop interview with young people, we can't tell you exactly how many of them are there, we can't tell you how old they are, we can't tell you where they're from, and we can't tell you what issues they're going to raise. We can give you some ideas and some suggestions, but maybe you should have a few people around you who can give you some ideas. And by the way, they type faster than you do. <laughs> they, they text message, so you, wanna, you may not actually understand some of the the symbols of language. Here's a little cheat sheet. This is what LOL means. This is what you know, GRAT means. This is this stuff. So it's like a real steep learning curve for politicians. But and, and I think like, some of them love it. Some of them hate it. And I can see the one chat we had with 55 young people and a minister. <laughs> <laughs> Except that was one that probably our minister was the most. Uh, you have a minister who likes the technology. So it's like, but overall, like the chat room, the discussion board, all of that, I think one of the things we've done while we're going on this whole different way of doing things to generate is we've, we've almost got government working on it. We've got gov some government to a place where we can say, like, pretty well with, I'd say, 99% certainty that if a young person emails a question to us, 
then we get a completion of the response within two weeks. We try doing that with a handwritten letter to the minister. One question there that just popped into my mind is the issue with the government not knowing how to use the technology rather than the population. Okay. <laughs> 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 but that's actually part of, of what it is. It's, you know, like, government doesn't know to the same degree that young people know. They can do all the stuff. Now, I didn't know to the All this stuff. And it's quite threatening. You know, like governments used to be, we know what's right for you. We know what policy making is all about. And suddenly this is a whole meeting that government I think that's maybe a little bit what I was trying to get at initially. So imagine that like you're involved in a community of interest online that just sprang up organically and I don't know, what, what is one? Bond ball. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Maybe it's really laughs> like that. And, and let's say that there were uh, a few people who happened to work for government also interested in that online community or uh, community of interest. Uh, and you had a problem that you wanted to discuss with somebody in government. And let's say even the, the problem didn't really have any direct bearing on what that employee of government really did in their job during the day. Do you think you'd feel comfortable uh, approaching that person and, and starting a conversation about resolving that issue? Well, the more sexual by internet access I think um, there's also the question of the shared interest there. If, someone, if government is interested in the same thing that you're interested in, be that wall falling, there's a basis for communication. I work for a Was there a comment up the back that you wanted to make? Yeah, you don't want to end up being government as a 
I'd like to ask a question of Helen um, about the second phase of the project that she's been involved in because really it started out as a government initiative and just at this stage getting to um, bring in agenda set from particular groups. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Um, your second phase of the project, trying to tailor make it and draw in particular groups that are using it, because it started out as a government initiative. It's still a government initiative. I would say it was never, it was never meant to be from the outset. Mm. It was meant to be mm. after government. So the collaboration was there right from the beginning. So that they recognised that they had, at that stage, nearly a thousand people who graduated through various government funded programs and instead of engaging them beyond the point of them leaving Canberra or beyond the point of the funding being signed off, but instead of engaging them after that point and saying, did it add value to you, you know, can we continue to talk to you, um, they then had to start that process with a whole other group of people and then let them go too. So what they said is we've got a potential resource here, we've got young people that have been engaged, that have founders that have received some services from us. And, and wouldn't it be better if we could keep those involved? So they asked the young people what sort of things would keep them involved. Do you want to know about events? Do you want to know about news? Do you want to know? Do you want to talk to other young people? Do you want to find them after you've gone home? So those those responses really informed how 
the infrastructure that was set up to support that initiative was developed. Now at this phase, uh, after the initiative being running for nearly two years, the question that they're asking based on bringing it much closer to the face-to-face activities, so instead of just engaging them at the beginning and then running their courses and face-to-face activities quite separately in the first year, the, the initiatives went closely aligned. In the second year, they said, well, let's promote this when the graduates are here. Let's get them using it while they're here. And through that process, the graduates start saying, well, we'd like to have discussion forums just for us when we go home. You know, so they were, they were demanding, in a way, additional services and and what that watching that, then they're fired up enormously and the type of activity that takes place is very different. They're actually they're getting organised, you know, they the discussion there is with the purpose, it's not putting a flag up what do you think about this particular idea. They're actually saying we need to form a group, we need to get organised, we need to target this funding. Who's gonna do the media release? Who's gonna do the draft funding application? Who are we gonna approach? And it's that action focused discussion that's occurring with the people we've actually met. And all this initiative is providing is the infrastructure for them to, to be organised, to continue to communicate, to report that stuff. So in this next phase, they're saying, are we trying to keep too much? Are we trying to spread our resources too thin? Should we really be working to support the graduates first rather than all young people in rural industries across Australia? And I think that's the challenge for that department at the moment, to decide, do we try and do everything? Or do we do we really try and work with these high achieving young people in rural industries who are already showing leadership, who are already showing potential to be possible influencers and contributors to policy development in the future? And so that's I mean that's the that's the uh, turning point at the moment. What can I do? What can I do? I am from India. I would like to ask about the community sector. You are also providing uh, government citizen centric services. If so, how the data is uh, authenticated by the government? Because ultimately you need some certificates. Anything from the government it needs to be authenticated by the government. How do you do it? Open a type of the information what you are offering to the patients. Like the certificates, property type certificates, birth certificates, etc. And also, is there any incentive to think that? Because in India, we are running several e-learning projects. But most of them, the basic problem we are facing is about the authenticity of the data. Whatever we are offering at the lowest level of the administration, to these uh, and uh, the end people etc. The government participates in the process. The government should authenticate the information. Ultimately, whatever it is offering, there is one problem that still we are facing. And the, do you value on the manual system or you are the entire manual system? Something is different. Um, authenticating the information from government is probably yeah. different. Yeah. Yeah. So, you say that the property tax, the property certificate. How do you ensure that uh, the data is Government agency as well. That's not even to the private community centre. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It's a good question. It goes beyond that particular project. Yeah. Because our project is actually the community centre. Where it is offering service. Indeed. It's only content dissemination. That's all. Yeah. Whatever you are doing is just content dissemination. Yeah. Oh. Yes. All, all the information and training is, is, is really of a complex nature at this point. If they are added with citizen service, sustainability is higher. How do you sustain this center? So only contain discrimination is one of the... Are you talking about once it's been disseminated within the community? How do you, how do you validate that it's still the same? Do you use the kiosk or something? You use the kiosk and you try to use the content to disseminate the content. We, we, so you provide any value and services there for the government? Our particular project is not providing up information as far as the basic problem we are facing. Yes, yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
common knowledge and scientific knowledge and so on, very um, relevant in the health field. Can I jump in there in, in saying that coming from a local government background, our local government website, um, we basically provide all our information openly on the internet, but anything which requires payment will require the customer to actually come into our premises to do business. But at this stage, we still cannot do planning certificates. Anything requiring certification, we can't do online. Well, with, that, with the current technology in our system, we can do rates. We can do rates, fine. Very important. Yes. <laughs> So that's kind of, sorry, that's a bit of an issue of trust, and I think trust runs through as a team, it's just about everything, and we're talking about whether we're trusting the information that's out there, whether the people are trusting the interaction, and I guess I have a question about when we start getting into um, putting up the, the digital storyboards and, and storylines and all that, that it's, I think one of the girls over here mentioned the idea of putting yourself out there is very difficult. Do. And that's been my experience in working with people that putting something online that's going to stay there and people are going to come and look at. That issue of, of trust kind of comes into that as to mm -hmm. how that information is going to be viewed, what's going to be done with it. And often um, boundaries are put around these various communities in order to try and build that trust. And I kind of hear that coming through with the, the group of graduates, but I wonder about it in terms of how that's going to operating your project. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we very chair, yeah, that's very much the issue, the question of trust. Um, uh, we've kind of identified that an important thing is to first get groups talking amongst themselves and establishing their own identities in their own communities and very much making themselves um, trusting of each other and the people that share their interests. Um, and then looking at how we can have a relationship with those communities that isn't um, restricted to their activity and what they're doing, that can actually build that trust between that community's interests and, and the government's interests. Um, um, and how we actually do that, I guess, is to be discovered. I just wanted to come back to what we talked about earlier, which is the digital storytelling technique, because uh, in fact it's to do with finding a way to take a risk to uh, uh, I don't know if I did the folks involved in the workshop uh, had no reason when they went in to think that they would be able to do what they could do when they came out. So there's an incredible process of trust in the living workshop itself that is gone through. And then at the end of it, what goes up on the web surprises the people who made it by having risk to take it. So we're not trying to address the issue of trust by protecting people from, you know, uh, we're trying to address the issue of trust by getting the process to work so that you can have to do it whenever it is. But it's something to do with managing risk I saw the showcase that was the outcome of the workshop that Ellie participated.
made it to him, and there was something like seven digital stories, I think, that was about frankly a number of people. And um, it's remarkable how personal the stories are that people have told to this audience. And, and we've sat and, and, you know, I say 50 of us kind of watched these movies that were very personal reflections about these people's lives. And that struck me as well. Now, what actually motivated those people to tell that personal story that they would otherwise not let the public know about? And I asked Daniel about that, and he said it's just part of the process that they have developed over the years, and that is a real innovation. Well, that is one of the innovations of, of that uh, digital storytelling method, is that through this process of group collaboration, they give feedback to each other on each other's ideas and what they're planning on saying, what they're suggesting to say, and um, and basically kind of uh, um, make it a little bit safer for the people so that they're not exposing too much about themselves, I think, to the point where they would be morally embarrassed, but exposing enough so that people are finding out who they are, kind of thing. Well, I just want to say three, though. It just seems to me that we're... We're working with a world medium now, and we have to consider the fact that the intellectual property of this, you know, people can make that gem as a one off. I mean, they post it on the web and it's gone. And, and should we be thinking about that? <laughs> We've got people from um, Creative Commons coming to talk to us soon at, at QUT, and yeah, definitely um, looking at open source licensing techniques is definitely the way to go with this kind of media. Right? Yeah, there's so much things like that. But just the, the original digital storytelling project of the Bible project is the BBC Wales, called Capture Wales, just called Capture Wales into Google. Uh, the, uh, there are about 200 of them now, about 150 in addition, about 250 in two to four years per story. Uh, the result of many workshops in the two to three years of the first time in the world. And the whole point is that the platform, and my expression is important, is that when the workshops are held, people know it's the BBC, they know that it's going to be on the website, which is because of the Facebook. So, in a sense, there's a kind of agreement that that's yeah. what you're yeah. yourself in for, and uh, in fact, the people who are doing it, again, we're speaking to the people who are doing it, and we're trying to put it on the website, and we're trying to put it on the website. And it's that relationship that actually does the work, rather than, oh, how about the case for a couple of years, or, you know, is there somebody who has a question of ownership? In fact, it doesn't really reach that threshold, but it's particularly in the context of the country. I don't know how you feel about yours, but I don't know. It wasn't done on the basis of I have produced artwork which is mine. No, if, if anything, you become aware of the constraints of copyright while you're making it, then you might have to get my guitar teacher to do some music because we want to make it. Um, and so it's, it's an interesting exercise in, in realising the constraints of creative, creative production for, for people involved. Because you think that you can do anything, but of course you can't. No. <laughs> I'm going to draw the session to a close here. I think we've had a very creative commons and some very interesting uh, storytelling. So thank you to the participants and also to the audience. Thank you.